Beloved Church of God, beginning our service before the Lord, let us stand and affirm the promise that relates to the door of our hope. Let the resurrection, resurrection of Christ reign in our bodies. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are grateful to your holy name for this once again privilege to be in this place that your hand has outlined for the worship of your holy name and allow your inheritance in the name of the covenant of blood to be lifted to heights unreachable to us and to break all evil and sin that binds us. May in the service be cursed, as before, all the works of devil, illnesses, poverty, premature death, demonic dependencies, all forms of fears, depression, destruction, covetousness, ignorance, all of this, let it depart from the tents of your holy people and stand, Lord, in the place of your rest, you and the ark of your greatness. And may your saints be clothed in your salvation, and may they rejoice before your count countenance. Give us more from your Spirit. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, and allow us to find your holy countenance. I present this service to your divine arms. Guide them with your uplifted hand, Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. May the Lord bless you. You may be seated.
And so before we again begin to submerge into the depths of God's wisdom, which is our inheritance, the unchanging epigraph of the study of the Word of God in Jesus Christ is Luke 24, 44. Then Jesus said to his disciples, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And for us, as partakers of the body of Christ, to share with Christ the fulfillment of all that is written about him in Scripture, we shall continue our study of our collaboration with the Holy Spirit and what is necessary to be done from our side so that we can receive the right to the power to put off our former way of life and put on the new form of life. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. To fulfill this command, as we already know, we need to utilize three charging and fundamental verbs, and these are to put off, be renewed, and put on. 
We've noted that our decision regarding these three destiny-affecting actions to put off, be renewed and put on will determine whether you transform yourself into a vessel of mercy or a vessel of wrath. Or more specifically, will the accomplishing of our salvation come to pass that is given to us in the format of a guarantee, or will we lose it forever? Although it may have been written there at one time. But we can lose it, and it will be blotted out of the Book of Life. In a specific format, we've already looked at the first two questions and have been studying the third question. What conditions do we need to fulfill so that by the means of an already renewed mind, we begin the process of dressing ourselves into the power of our new person that is created in accordance to God in Christ Jesus in righteousness and holy truth? And when we're talking about dressing ourselves as our body, not the spirit and the soul, because the spirit already has that essence. It is new in nature. It is born from God. A renewed mind is already a part of our soul that was uh, uh, submerged into death and resurrected. We're talking about the dressing of our mortal body into the new person. And when we speak of clothing ourselves into the power of our new person that contains the power of the resurrection of Christ in the all armor of light, we've concluded that we need God's help in the form of His redeeming mercy. The means of receiving any kind of help in the form of the inheritance of the mercies of God is weaponry of prayer or worship in spirit and in truth. Since prayer is in jan- just a man's means of communicating with God, but also a kind of legal and sacral right that a man gives heaven, a tool that activates the given law of God, man gives heaven this right so that heaven may intervene upon the territory of earth considering that the most powerful form of prayer is a continual prayer that does not back away from its goal until what is asked for is received. We together have been studying the format of continual prayer in the breastplate of judgment of the high priest being a continual remembrance or memorial before God. The power of such a prayer is called to demonstrate the unlimited authority of God over over our genesis and allotted by him for us time and boundaries. Due to this, we came to the necessity to study the goal God pursues in his intentions when he urges and calls his children to become warriors in prayer and also in what way and upon what conditions God is able and desires to give man the right to become a warrior in prayer so that man may be able to present the interests of God and implement his inheritance in God. According to the revelation of Scripture, our prayer as a warrior in prayer is identified in the virtue of 12 precious stones of the breastplate of judgment, and it needs to be continual, persistent, diligent, with boldness, with reverence, with faith of your heart, with thanksgiving, with joy, in the fear of the Lord, in the Holy Spirit, or praying in tongues. In the previous services, we in a specific format have already looked at the essence of the first eight components that identify the state of the heart of a warrior in prayer, as well as the quality of his prayer, and stopped to study the ninth component, quality of continual prayer. This is the presence of the fear of the Lord in your prayer, or prayer that is made in the fear of the Lord. But first, I would like to once again present the antonyms or opposite qualities of prayer that have already been a part of our studies, because understanding the context or background of each quality, we will better understand the quality and character of true prayer. And so the antonym of continual is unfaithful or not continuing. The antonym of persistent is resisting. The antonym of diligent is lazy. The antonym of boldness is audacity. The boldness of rever- the antonym of reverence is forsaking and hatred. The antonym of the faith of God is unbelief or resisting the faith of God. The antonym of thanksgiving is unthankful, hard-hearted, or stiff-necked. The antonym of joy is sorrow or brokenness that dries the bones. And the antonym of the fear of the Lord is the fear of man. As in the previous qualities of prayer, it is necessary for us to look at four classical questions. First, from what wellspring does the fear of the Lord flow? And what qualities or criteria does the fear of the Lord have? Second, what purpose is the fear of the Lord supposed to fulfill within our relationship with God, with each other, and with all of the world? 
Third, what price or what conditions do we need to fulfill so we can be filled with the fear of the Lord in prayer? Or how do we keep or increase the fear of the Lord within our heart? And fourth, by what results do we need to examine ourselves on the presence of the fear of the Lord within our heart? In the previous services, we in a particular format together have studied the essence of the first question and stopped to study the second question. We've noted that the fear of the Lord and the fear of man are two absolutely different programs that come from two diametrically opposite wellsprings, identifying the program of eternal life that comes from God, containing the quality of the nature of God, and the program of eternal death, coming from the entrails of the fallen cherubim, containing his quality and his nature. The first Adam, due to his disobedience to God, was transformed into the programmable system of the fallen angel and inherited from him a program opposite of God's fear, which was passed down to all mankind and came to be called the fear of man. The character included in the fear of the Lord, as with the previous qualities, is prescribed in Scripture for creating of your prayer as a commandment, as a requirement, a direct order that can't be ignored, and a military command. If not fulfilled, the verdict is death. That is a final break of your peaceful relationship with God. The fear of the Lord has a program identifying the life of God as identified as the spring of the wisdom of God and as a carrier and demonstrator of this wisdom. And as a program, it is able to exist and demonstrate itself in nothing else but a programmable system, identifying the wisdom of the heart, which is the heart of a born-from-God man that becomes a possessor. So when a person becomes a possessor of a faithful mind abiding in the commandment of the Lord, then this means that the fear of the Lord is in him. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, a good understanding of all those who do His commandments. His praise endures forever. Psalm 110.10 We've noted that the reason for many misconceptions and wrongs is what our mind is dependent upon or from. If we place our mind in dependence of man, we will be pleasing because of our weakness, their ignorance, and their religious ambitions. If we place our mind in dependence of the traditions of man, then for the sake of those traditions we will remove or move the commandments of God aside. If we place our mind in dependence of logical thinking or obtained experience, then, then we also will be far from the fear of the Lord. As the fear of the Lord, as the wisdom of God, isn't against logical or rational thinking, but because of its eternal being or existence and exalted nature in the fourth, in the fourth dimension, it does not depend on logic and governs logic. Therefore, only when we, contrary to many human authorities, place our mind in dependence from the revelation of Scripture, that is when we will be able to be filled with the fear of the Lord demonstrated in His divine and exceeding wisdom. We know that the world we live in has many forms of existing fear and even more phobias. And practically, the entire world is underpinned by fear and phobias. But all of these forms of fear come from one wellspring, the fallen cherubim. These fears were inherited from the first Adam when he sinned and were passed on genetically to all mankind. And further, all of these forms of fear do not parallel or identify with the unique and great nature of fear that comes from God and is passed down by right of birth from God to man in the form of a seed that a person needs to then grow into fruit of the fear of the Lord. We need to keep in mind that there is a healthy form of fear that exists as well amongst men. A healthy form of fear that is a form of healthy thinking that does not yield suffering. Any form of fear that does not come from God yields suffering. At the same time, the, f the fear of the Lord prompts a trembling reverence before God and an unexplainable admiration and delight as it places man in the safest place called God. As it is written, there is no fear in love. It's talking about the uh, love of the Lord Agape. But perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. 1 John 4.18 
Therefore, if our worship is done out of the fear of the Lord, contained within the twelve precious stones of the breastplate of judgment, then it cannot be accepted by God. And that is specifically why any attempt to enter the presence of God, to call upon God or to serve God without the presence of the fear of the Lord deeply offends God, does not consider God, and actually resists God. The absence of the fear of the Lord within the heart of a man testifies about the fact that this person is bound by the fear of man or human fear. According to scripture, a cowardly person is marching to hell first. They lead all of the rest of evil do rest of the evil doers, but the most shameful fear for God before God is the fear of man. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, Revelations 21.8. And so the cowardly perfectly understands what the truth is, but is afraid to confess it, uh, is afraid of his surroundings, afraid of his relatives, uh, is afraid of other people. Uh, religious people in the atheist world many people were afraid of the atheist people and confessed didn't confess that they were Christian one Episcopal said I 40 years am a Christian and at work no one even knows it he was boasting about that But it turned out everywhere I went people immediately knew I was Christian even if I didn't talk about it Immediately, people, for some reason, had curiosity of who I am. I remember before I came to America, I decided to take some courses in English. And I came, uh, I I didn't know anybody who was there. They didn't know me. On the next day, they surrounded me, those that were my classmates, and asked me, who you who I am and I said I'm a person they said no we know you're a person but you're not a regular person you have appeared amongst us and all of us became very curious and some kind of draw to you you're not like we are and one told me one woman told me Tell me tr- the truth. Are you an alien? And I said, how did you guess? And she said, see, I told you, I told you guys that he's an alien. You see, when a person is filled with God, people uh, have some kind of illusion that you're not of this world, but you truly are not of this world. God has chosen you uh, from this world and I tell them, I'm a Christian, but they said, what do you mean you're a Christian? And I said, true Christians are not are people not belonging to this world, and they belong to heaven. Another person communicating with me on the next day, this was a captain of a specific rank, also a psychologist. He was edu- an educated psychologist, and he said, you know, I was passing by, and I became curious. I'm a psychologist, but you are not uh, obedient to the laws of psychology, and you are completely different, and you're somehow out of this boundary. According to psychology, when a person begins to talk about mountains, uh, the next person also talks about the mountains or any other subject, but you, whatever I talk to you about, you always draw everything to Christ. And I could not. You're a unique person. And so cowardly and unfaithful people, what what is a cowardly person? A person who does not have enough fear of the Lord. This is a suffering, a form of suffering. People think that they can live by two standards, a worldly standards and also God's standards, coming here and having the look of godliness. This is very dangerous. I want to warn those who have received salvation, if you will be live truly by Christ and in Christ, you will attract to yourself as a magnet as 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 a magnet and metal you will attract people to yourself people will be surprised people will be fascinated by you because you will be the true light
We know that the word, the words fear, wisdom, and commandment when it comes to the nature of God are identical as they identify the moral virtues of God. And because they are identical, the one word describes the other word as they come one from the other and authenticate one the other. This is specifically why the fear of the Lord is the true wisdom of God presented in the commandments of the Lord. At the same time, true wisdom in the commandments of the Lord are identified as the fear of the Lord, identifying the given law of God. And now question two, what purpose does the fear of the Lord have in our relationship with God, with each other, and with all of the world? Studying the purpose of the fear of the Lord, we need to keep in mind that the boundaries of the fear of the Lord as the program of God are restricted to the boundaries of the heart of one that fears God and the boundaries of their knowledge of the fear of the Lord. In a specific format, we have already studied four purposes of the fear of the Lord containing the heart, contained in the heart of a person fearing God, and I will remind us of them, and we will turn, we have studied nine, and we will study the tenth today. The purpose of the fear of the Lord being the equivalent of the love, of our love for God, is called to cast out the fear of man, which produces suffering. The purpose of the fear of the Lord is called to give those who fear God a banner so that they display it on behalf of the truth to be delivered from the enemy. The purpose of the fear of the Lord is called to bring forth the mercy of the Lord upon those who fear God, with the purpose of removing their transgressions so far as far as east is from the west. The purpose of the fear of the Lord is called by the means of the mercy of the Lord to separate men who fear God from men that do not have the fear of the Lord, by rewarding one or pouring out his vengeance on the other. Fifth, the purpose of the fear of the Lord in the heart of those who fear God is called to turn God's favor upon them. Sixth, the purpose of the fear of the Lord is called to lead those who fear God into the inheritance of the covenant of the Lord, to give them food so God could give them the lands of other nations. Seventh, the purpose of the fear of the Lord is called to make those who fear God a tool of vengeance upon the angry Gentiles, to destroy them for destroying the earth. Eighth, the purpose of the fear of the Lord is, ca is called in those who fear the Lord to praise and glorify God. This is so that God not despise or abhor their affliction and that God not hide his face from them when they cry out to him. Ninth, the purpose of the fear of the Lord gives us the ability to not find lawlessness when we search our heart which provides God a basis to, to hear our prayer when we confess our sins, which has taken a hold of us as a stranger, or in the format of a stranger. And number 10, now the purpose of the fear of the Lord within a person that fears God is called to provide God grounds to dress him into an eternal mercy of God. This is one of the wonderful Psalms of David that, Literally, in every word and every phrase, there's a surprising revelation of God for us. O give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say, His mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say, His mercy endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say, His mercy endures forever. I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord for me and is among those who help me. Therefore, I shall see my desire on those who hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. They surrounded me, yes, they surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. They surrounded me like bees. They were quenched like a fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. You pushed me violently that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. The the voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. You see the most amazing revelations shown here that a person 
physically has taken by faith but hasn't received. These, this person died receiving it by faith but didn't receive it. And so David, in order to write these words, this per- David needed to have this uh, revelation about the body being dressed into the new person. And so he says, I shall not die but live. But he did die. But he confessed this promise that God had accounted to him. And many died in the faith, not receiving what was promised. Why? Because God had foreseen us so that they without us not receive perfection because this promise is for the last times or for the holy people, the saints, the uh, small remnant of God that is to receive it. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day of the Lord. He has made it. He will rejoice and be glad in it. Psalm 118, 1 through 24. So the day of the Lord that talks about a new person created in accordance to God in Christ Jesus in righteousness and holy truth. When the scriptures refer, I'm returning to what we were talking about the beginning of the psalm, when the scripture refers to any sort of seed, then it means a program that is contained in a seed. When the scriptures refer to a fruit, then it means the fruit that is grown from this seed. Therefore, according to the above revelation, we conclude that the purpose of the fear of the Lord within the heart of those who fear God is called to form them from the seed of Israel. Remember, we talked about this. Those who fear the Lord is the seed of Israel. But here it's not talking about the seed, but the house of Israel. And so it's called to form them from the seed of Israel into the house of Israel and the house of Aaron. This is the new Jerusalem containing 12 pearly gates and the tree of life that grows in the midst of the new Jerusalem that bears its fruit 12 times. The tree of life that bears its fruit 12 times Each tree yielding its fruit every month, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and a servant shall serve him, they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. The renewed mind is the name of God upon their foreheads. There shall be no night there. It's not talking about the physical night or the physical day. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Revelation 22 through 2, 2 through 5. This is talking about the reign of Christ within the mortal body. It's talking about a Jerusalem that is in the aspect of time. According to the elements of the given allegory, the subject is the new Jerusalem that is located on earth within the aspect of time. This is the new Jerusalem. It is the chosen by God remnant identifying the bride of the Lamb. Since in the heavens or in the new heaven and new earth, the need for healing won't exist for the nations that will be there because the nations that will be able to enter the heavens live in the aspect of eternal life as the angels of God and are not able to get sick. Revelations 21, 1 through 4. Now I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Here it's talking about the new heaven and new earth. But before this, it was talking about the new Jerusalem in the aspect of time, and not in the future. 
If, we, if you are to apply the language format of a sport com commentator to today's turning events within the body of Christ, then it will sound something like this. The revelation spoken by Apostle John 2,000 years ago have approached their finish point. So returning to the house of Israel and the house of Aaron, we note that the purpose of the fear of the Lord within the heart of those who fear God is called to heal, heal their body and eliminate all curses from their body so that the fear of the Lord could build them into the house of Israel and the house of Aaron. In other words, the purpose of the fear of the Lord within the heart of those who fear God is called to dress their body into the fruits of the tree of life, into their new person created in accordance to God in Christ Jesus in righteousness and holy truth, so that they would be in accordance to the requirements of the house of Israel and house of Aaron. Looking at the definition of the fear of the Lord within the heart of those who fear God, we need, we need to answer two questions. First, what criteria do the scriptures attribute to the house of Israel and the coming from her house of Aaron within the heart of those who fear God. Second, what goal does God pursue in dressing our body into the house of Israel and the coming from her house of Aaron? We will remember that identifying the house of Israel and the coming from her house, her house of Aaron, we will be identifying the characteristics of our body dressed into the fruit of the tree of life, which is our new person. The house of Israel of the twelve tribes called by the names of the sons of Israel, the son of Isaac, who was born from Abraham. Therefore, the symbol of the house of Israel within the heart of those who fear God are the twelve pearly gates within the twelve, with the twelve names of the sons of Israel opening the way to the tree of life. With all of this, we need to not forget that in Scripture, the symbol of the number 12, when it's 12 names of Israel, is a symbol of management identifying the order of God's theocracy within the heart of those who fear God. The symbol of management in the 12 names of Israel is the name of the Lord upon the foreheads of those who fear God that is called to demonstrate itself in the renewed mind of those who fear God. The mortal bodies of those who fear God, not looking at the existing in these bodies, law of sin and death are beginning to be controlled by the power of their renewed mind, who in the example of Moses was drawn from the water or risen from the dead, confronted the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, representing the mind of man. And so before we are dressed into our new person, we already will not be uh, dealing with our old person because we have a renewed mind that does not consider the Pharaoh and does not consider the old person, the sinful person. He is uh, confronting the law of sin and death and does not consider or counsel with him. He will be eliminated and, and the law of the spirit of life will take control when we will be dressed into our new person. And again, specific people come to me and ask the question, where specifically is the law of sin and death? Where is it located? In the soul, body? Of course, it cannot be in the soul. It is in the body. Death, what is it, immortal? Our spirit is immortal. That part of the soul that is connected to the spirit, it is also immortal. But that part of the soul that is connected to the body is mortal. And it belongs to the body, the mortal body, the law of sin and death. And the law of sin and death is in the body. And what is this law of sin and death? First, just to show you where the law of sin and death is, it was in the Garden of Eden. The law of sin and death was in the Garden of Eden. The tree of life is the law of the spirit of life. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the law of sin and death. If this tree was not existing, this tree of knowledge of good and evil, there would not have been sin. Because while there's no law, there's no sin. What does the law do? It dis, uh, it, it identifies the sin. Uh, if there's no law, then there would not be sin. But God had put, for some reason, in the Garden of Eden, two laws. And he is the giver of these two laws. He is the giver of the laws. He created the one and the other tree. The one is his holy, sacred tree. And if you, when you touch it, if you take of it, it destroys you. Many people say, my sword will be shiny. In their songs they sing that it will sparkle, it will be shiny. Why do you need the sword? 
The sword is not the law of the spirit of life. The word of God, as the living water, it is the spirit of life. But the word of God as a sword, as an arrow, or as a... As, as many other examples, it is not the spirit of life, but the, it's, 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 it's demonstrating death, uh, division, and within the body. And so the law of Moses, or the law of God that was focused and then became the law of Moses in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, became, gave power to sin, and the power of sin is the law. And so God is an uh, all-consuming fire who can live in the midst of this uh, con all-consuming fire. You remember that furnace, strong furnace, that Daniel and the three young men refused to worship the king, and these th three young men were cast into this furnace. It was hot as never before, and those who were throwing him in there uh, casting them in there, uh, they were burned. These three fall in, these die who threw them in, but they are walking in this fire, and they felt, uh, in, according to scripture, uh, as if a, a light breeze, uh, like in the cool of the day, and a fourth one was among them, walking and singing, and they ended up in paradise. God took this strong fire, because he is all-consuming fire, and in this fire he demonstrated himself. If you have the law of the spirit of life, if, it is, if the fear of the Lord is in you, you will not be afraid. The law of Moses becomes your friend, and no longer becomes the law of sin and death. For one, it kills. For the other, it gives life. There are people who live in it. If you look at all of the unclean animals, these are the holiness of God. They were the holiness of God. Who can touch the holiness of God? Who ate of it? What is forbidden? The house of Aaron ate of it. The house of Aaron ate the holy portion they touched it and didn't die. And you also, your kings and priests, to God. I want us to understand, as soon as the Spirit of God begins to come down upon you, then the law of sin and death will change into the law of the Spirit of life, because the law of the Spirit of life will eliminate this law of sin and death. We talked about the law of grace. It comes from the law of Moses. It talks about this grace everywhere, but at the same time, it's not dependent upon this law, and the, the righteousness of God was shown to us independent from the law of Moses through God's grace. And so the mortal bodies of those who fear God, not looking at the existing in these bodies, law of sin and death, are beginning to be controlled by the power of their renewed mind, who in the example of Moses was drawn from water and the nation of Israel the Pharaoh existed and people were afraid of the Pharaoh but Moses were the one, was the one directing the renewed mind and the house of Aaron comes from the third son of Israel Levi when God selected whom God had selected from the twelve tribes of Israel for priesthood and of Levi he said let your Thummim and your Urim be with your Holy One whom you tested at Massa and with whom you contended at the waters of Meribah who say of his father and mother I have not seen them nor did he acknowledge as brothers and know his own children for they have observed your word and kept your covenant they shall teach Jacob your judgments and Israel your law they shall put incense before you and a whole burnt sacrifice on your altar bless his substance Lord and accept the works of his hands strike the loins of those who rise against him and of those who hate him that they rise not again Deuteronomy 33 8 through 11 according to this place of scripture we conclude that the Ar the house of Aaron is called to stand on guard before God for the entire congregation of the sons of Israel or carry responsibility before God for the entire congregation of the sons of Israel and Moses said to Aaron and to Eleazar and Ithmar his sons do not uncover your heads, nor tear your clothes, lest you die, and wrath come upon all of the people. You see, from them, depend, the, the entire congregation dependent upon them. 
And so these, the nation, the congregation that had began to do these lawless works, uh, he said to Aaron that do not feel bad, but let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Lord has kindled. You shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of meeting lest you die, for the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you and they did according to the word of Moses Leviticus 10 6 through 7 therefore a symbol of the house of Aaron within the heart of those who fear God are the twelve precious stones of the breastplate of judgment with the twelve names of the sons of Israel enveloping the house of Aaron into the power of a warrior in prayer which provides God grounds to perform power which will turn those who fear God into his eternal mercy by the means of his eternal mercy God will dress the body of the one that fears God into the fruits of the tree of life grown within the heart of the one that fears God this is their new person created in accordance to God in Christ Jesus in righteousness and holy truth and so now question two, what goal does God pursue in dressing our, mo- our mortal body into the house of Israel and the coming from her house, the house of Aaron? The scriptures call those who fear God by the means of thanksgiving to turn God's fear upon them, which is the equivalent of the mercy of God to eradicate the enemy that lives in their body and out of their body as well. Psalm 118, 1-4 O give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his mercy endures forever let Israel now say his mercy endures forever let the house of Aaron say his mercy endures forever let those who fear the Lord now say his mercy endures forever Psalm 118, 1-4 the word now is used three times in the given place of scripture and it means today immediately at this time when you hear this Therefore, the word now is a symbol of the word faith received by a revelation of the Holy Spirit in our heart, which is used for fulfillment of what is hoped for and confidence in the unseen. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11.1 1. And so faith brings to life the things that we are hoping for or waiting for. And so when it says, now this is right now, this is the revelation of God that is being activated, being done right now. Confession that is in accordance to the will of God in the dimension of time provides God a basis to accomplish the promises confessed in the dimension of time. The word give thanks, activating the word now when it's regarding God, possesses a surprising consistency identifying the collaboration of man with the mercy of God. Accomplishing your role in giving thanks, man provides God grounds to accomplish his will, to eliminate all of the enemies of man that are the enemies of God and dress man into his mercy. To give thanks means to shoot with an arrow into the appointed by God goal to throw a stone into the head of your Goliath with a sling using a spear or lance nail down the sin of adultery to admit and confess your sin before God to tame or manage the anger of God's wrath by condemning your sin withhold your anger and calm yourself by meditating about God to bring God's heart peace to thank God for redemption from the sinful body for the adoption of our body to praise and give thanks to God for the works he has done in Hebrew the phrase to praise God means to praise Yahweh or hallelujah this is practically the formula of worship and thanksgiving of the Israelites that served God that just as the word amen has been adopted by other languages without change because the phrase praise Yahweh is placed first in David's psalm we conclude that the author is specifically inviting those who fear God to share with him this extraordinary calling aimed to destroy the enemy within your body as well as out of your body so that you can dress your body into the mercy of the Lord. Therefore, those who fear God are people like the author of this psalm. They are like the author of the psalm that they know who God is to them and what God has done for them to redeem them fully so that their spirit, soul, and body would be partakers and messengers of the glory of God upon earth. The Ten Commandments contain one commandment that warns man not to take the name of the Lord God in vain that is uselessly this is the third commandment given to protect or defend the worthy name of God you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain Exodus 20 
7. In vain is unlawfully not having legal foundation or legal grounds for. This directs us to the fact that to give thanks and praise God is something that only those who fear God can do, those that possess the ability to perform righteousness. The Jews didn't completely understand this or correctly understand it, and so they replaced the name Yahweh with the name Lord or Adonai. They still do not pronounce this name. They don't even write it. They write... Uh, they write uh, Lord, but they do not actually uh, write Yahweh or say it. And so Jehovah, that they uh, also say, Jehovah, the name Jehovah, is also an incorrect pronunciation of Yahweh. And so they in vain, uh, they pretty much without legal foundation or grounds pronounce God's name or spoke God's name. If you're a righteous one, only then can you pronounce this name, Yahweh. Only the fear of the Lord and those who fear God gives them the legal right to demonstrate the redemption of Yahweh and his mercy to make him known in heaven, on earth, and in hell. Psalm 33, 1 through 4. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. In the, in the original it says, uh, Rejoice in Yahweh, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. It says, In the Lord, but it's translated from as Adonai, Rejoice in the Lord, praise the Lord with the harp, make melody to him with an instrument of ten strings, sing to him a new song, play skillfully with a shout of joy, for the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. Psalm 33, 1-4. Beautiful, where it says, is beautiful, praise from the upright is beautiful. Beautiful in the situation is satisfying the demands of God, fitting for the use of the Holy Spirit, worthy of God by his demonstration of holiness, prepared to immediately fulfill the will of God. Looking at these characteristics, we conclude that if a man does not possess the qualities and the likeness of God, then his thanksgiving before God is nothing more than an abominable nature of work, only an imitation of thanksgiving. This is why sometimes it appears to be a well-prepared song according to the demands of the truth. However, all, all seems or appears correct, and the melody is correct. However, you experience some kind of disharmony, an inner rejection and unpleasantness. The true meaning of thanksgiving to God is not just a poem or song that praises God. It's life that is de dedicated to God where everything is done for God's sake, in the name of God, and in God. If a person possesses a developed gift of song but is not dedicated to God in the fear of the Lord and attempts to perform a highly artistic and classical piece that in its time was inspired by the Holy Spirit, then God views such a performance as a mockery or the shaming of His holy name. He speaks about this through Isaiah 66, 3 through 5. He who kills a bull is as if he slays a man. He who sacrifices a lamb as if he breaks a dog's neck. He who offers a gain offering as if he offers swine's blood. He who burns incense as if he blessed an idol. Just as they have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations, they have chosen their own ways and serve God still. And, and they base it upon their own ways, upon their own uh, conditions, and their soul delights in their abominations. So will I choose their delusions and bring their fear on them, because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not hear, but they did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I do not delight. Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word, your brethren who hated you, who cast you out for my name's sake, said, Let the Lord be glorified, that we may see your joy, but they shall be ashamed. The time will come, and the Lord will shame the wicked and lawless. Looking back at our primary subject of study and the place of Scripture thanksgiving to the Lord, 
When it says, Thanksgiving to the Lord is first calling upon the name of Yahweh, second, the proclamation of the works of Yahweh in the nations, third, the demonstration of good, of good founded upon the eternal mercy of Yahweh, and fourth, the thanksgiving of Yahweh coming from the heart of one that fears God. Now, in short, we will remember the criteria that identify the essence of these four components, identifying thanksgiving to God. To call upon the name of Yahweh is practically glorifying and praising God for the work of redemption that he has done for those those who fear God. This element is most serious and is the most serious and vital spiritual discipline that needs to be the most significant component in our worship demonstrated in thanksgiving, because it is from this fundamental discipline that all of the rest of the spiritual disciplines function. Specifically, the discipline of worship and thanksgiving carries the full grandeur of God's kingdom in the entrails of our spirit. The work of, of the word to call when it comes to man and God is translated from the Greek verb akouen, to listen. The full form of this verb is pronounced as gup akouen, to demonstrate obedience. It is because of this obedience to listen to the voice of God within your heart, the preached word by God's delegated person that bears the fruit of God. Because faith comes about from listening to the word of God, when it not when we read it, but when we listen to it. When it comes to man, faith is trust in the word of God that we hear and that deserves complete trust. When it comes to man, to call upon God means to listen to God with the readiness to immediately fulfill what you hear. Therefore, since a, Hebrews 4, 1 through 3, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he said, So I swore by my wrath that they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Hebrews 4, 1 through 3. We know that the nation of Israel did not enter God's peace, and Joshua was not able to uh, enter, bring them to God's peace, and they followed the Sabbath thinking they were in his peace. But it is written, if they had entered the rest, then it, the things would not have been written as they are. The faith of God obtains its place and individuality within our heart only when man from his side dissolves the faith of God with his faith. This is identified as an undeviating obedience to the faith of God. Therefore, to glorify the Lord and to praise Yahweh first means to call upon the name of Yahweh or demonstrate obedience to the faith of God, because without such obedience it is impossible to please God. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. And so without obedience to the faith of God, it is impossible to please Him, for he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Hebrews 11.6 Therefore, the absence of faith in prayer is viewed according to Scripture as disobedience to the will of God or resisting God, which is why the presence of faith in prayer is elevated to a rank of a commandment. Have faith in God, Mark 11, 23. And when it says have faith in God in this place of Scripture, this is as a command, as a military, say, command. Have faith in God, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says in his, to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he, he says, Mark 11, 23. And of course we need to remember that we can put aside by faith or cast into the depths of the great water waters only those mountains that are in our way of accomplishing the will of God and stand exclusively within the boundaries of our personal responsibility. We do together have we together have paid attention to the fact that there are two forms of faith that exist, the faith of God and the faith of man. Furthermore, abilities and perspectives exist for the faith of God as well as our faith. The essence, abilities, and perspectives of the faith of, of 
of man as well as the abilities and per- perspectives of the faith of God are presented in Scripture in seven components. The faith of God is the essence of God contained in the treasure of the Holy Scriptures. The faith of God is the absolute truth of God. The faith of God is the imperishable seed of God. The faith of God is the sovereignty of God. The faith of God is the goal orientation of God. The faith of God is the inheritance of God placed upon our account. The faith of God is the eternal, all-powerful, and bottomless and energetic potential of God. And now in the exact same way we will bring forth the abilities and perspectives of our faith called to collaborate with the faith of God by which we will be in the state to overcome a kingdom, to perform righteousness, to receive the promise, to guard the mouth of lions, to quench the fire, to escape the sharp sword, to strengthen or to be strengthened in weakness be strong for battle, to drive away the armies of others, receive our dead alive again or resurrected, to test those things, also test what is means to be within prison, to be tested, to die by the sword, and to experience sorrow and difficulty. And so our faith is a unique genetic organ reading, caring, and passing on information. Our faith is a programmable system that reads the program of God, the genetic organ, a spiritual genetic organ that we receive. Our faith (coughs) is our sovereignty. Our faith is obedience to the received bias information together with the act of our mind and willing decision. Our faith is a dissolver of the received by us information. Our faith is a carrier and producer of the seed of information. Our faith is a an egg that receives the seed of information we receive. The word is the seed, and so when you receive the word of God or anyone else's word, you receive it by faith, then what you've received, this organ, it what, what it receives, this is it's the egg that receives the seed. Our faith is the eternal energetic potential also. And now let us pay attention to the next definition of the fear or purpose of the fear of the Lord that is contained in the command to thank Yahweh or thanksgiving to Yahweh. To thank God is to make known, to identify what is evil before God and what makes him angry or provokes his wrath. What kind of works does the Holy Spirit call those who fear God to do in the nations? God created the heavens and the earth. But if you base everything just as some God creating just the physical world, if you look at it as a paint, you would be looking at a painting of an artist. You would not be looking, understanding all of the depths that are included in God's work. It would just be as what you would see in front of your eyes as a painting. Romans 1, 18 through 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who surp- suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what... What may be known of God and mani- is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world is invisible, attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Romans 1, 18 through 20. And so saying that a law can exist without a lawgiver is something foolish and idi- physically idiotic people would say. And so people who believe that there's a law without a lawgiver, they say this is the laws of nature, but I say, who had implemented these laws? How did the law appear without a lawgiver? It's not logical. And so if a person is in the form of an idiot, then that is how it continues. And so what works of God can we, should we proclaim in our thanksgiving 
And the answer is one. These are those works that in some level depend upon us, that people without our participation would never be able to see. And these works are our personal life and our personal testimony where we demonstrate the works of God that he has done in us, changing our character into the character of his son, Jesus Christ. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another, John 13, 35. These are the works that we need to demonstrate. This is our uh, relationship with each other, our forgiveness, our covering of one the other. And so when we come to God, our spirit uh, burns, but the character uh, is still there. And so sometimes we're afraid to say that, afraid to admit that we have uh, flaws in our character. And so we need to actually reveal them so that they may be eliminated. And so when we begin to understand, and not emotionally, but are obedient to the word of God, just obedient to it, and begin to forgive each other. But when characters begin to truly change, this is something undescribable for the person himself. Because an unchanged character, what does a person do? He's angry, he's suffering, he's, he's jealous. But when the character begins to change, a person is at peace. Whatever may happen, he is at peace. He has peace in himself. But a person with an unchanged character cannot have peace in his soul. He cannot have peace in his soul. He's just as the unclean, but is not called an unclean person because he's just an infant, spiritual infant. He's ha given the opportunity to grow, but w and when the time comes, God gives time for every person, and every person he gives a specific amount of time to come out of this position of spiritual infant uh, infancy or child, uh, a child, a state of, chi of being a child spiritually. If he decides not to grow and change in his character, then he is as any other sin a sinful person because he chooses to carry lawlessness and yet demonstrate or show uh, to in front of others or walk in front of others uh, appearing as if he is righteous. Summing up this definition of thanksgiving, praising God is demonstrating his character in front of each other and the third definition of the fear of the Lord is to praise Yahweh in praising Yahweh is to demonstrate the goodness of God in his eternal mercy we need to remember the criteria that the scriptures provide the essence of goodness this goodness is an, an element or quality uh, exclusively belonging to our Heavenly Father. Luke 18, 18 through 19, Now a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. This revelation about belonging, the good belonging only to the Heavenly Father is noted by three authors in Scripture. And Christ clearly states this in the three different places. Goodness is somehow uh, linked to subordination and the relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Son, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, and the Son and Holy Spirit demonstrate God's goodness in His will. It's a discipline that is not uh, of that did not come from man. God's goodness is God's will. Out of God's instructions and laws, any goodness is seen as evil, and the desire to know good and evil is not possible out of God's instructions. Only God instructs us on what is good and what is evil. Before the, at the judgment seat, all good will be analyzed as for what it, whether it was good or what whether it was evil and what this person has done in his life whether it be good or evil there exists only one definition of goodness 
And this is the will of the Heavenly Father that is presented in His Word that come out, came out of His mouth, that he has, God is placed above all of His name, He magnified above His name, and that the Father Himself first worships and then the Son and the Holy Spirit. Here's what God s- says about Prophet Micah, Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. From this place of Scripture, we conclude that goodness, as an identification of the will of God, is the work of justice, loving mercy, and walking before God. And so, to perform good, identified as the will of God, we need to choose only one truth that comes from God in the format of the elementary teachings of Christ and listen to only one God by those delegated people who He has sent. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her, Luke 10, 40-42, that good part she chose the will of God. According to this place of Scripture, Scripture becomes clear that listening to the word that the delegated people of God preach is listening to God, which is the good work. Many people who believe in God and who have received salvation have fallen away from God because they stopped listening to His delegated persons and in result became unworthy of salvation. The will of God comes from the Father and is fulfilled or accomplished by the Son and Holy Spirit. And that's why Jesus said, Why do you call me good? There's only one that is good. And that's the Heavenly Father. Goodness is the will of God. I'm not the lawgiver. The Father is the lawgiver, and I fulfill His laws. The Holy Spirit trembles and waits to hear what God will say so that He can fulfill it. The absence of true goodness in man, a man that comes from God or comes to God, is specific religious sects that will arise at the last times. <clears throat> and this will be allowed to be able to grow his people into perfection and form them into perfection. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves. It's talking about people in the church. Uh, In the world, people have always been this way, but it's talking about people that in the last times this will be happening in the church amongst religious uh, people. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self, control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. Do not be friends with such and do not walk with such. A person that wants to change the situation to uh, present himself as good before God, nothing of this world will help him because goodness is a demonstration of the fruits of the Spirit coming from the tree of life. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. And so the law cannot give power if there's no sin. And so the law gives power to sin, and the law then begins to work in your favor because there's no sin. The double-edged sword is the one that is sharp on both ends. It has no handle. It is sharp from both ends. If you have something in you that is not in accordance to the demands of holiness, it will kill you. The power of sin is the law, but everything is good in you, then the sword in your mouth will strike others who have sin.
And so keep in mind, when you sing about the sword of the Lord, this is the uh, double-edged sword. This is one that has sharp edges on both sides. It has no handle. It comes from your mouth. And if you confess the word of God, the sword is the word of God, and suddenly your conscience begins to condemn you that you're not in accordance to God's uh, standards or the standards of a certain truth. This condemnation is that sword. When your conscience is not judging you, then this talks about the fact that now you can speak and the sword will strike others. You are righteous. The fruit of the Spirit <coughs> is that goodness that is demonstrated in good works that is fulfilling the will of God. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, Ephesians 2.10. And the concluding accord of fulfilling the will of God is our collaboration with God in adopting our bodies where God is intending to dress into the fruit of our spirit that is our new person created in accordance to God in Christ Jesus. The fourth uh, definition of the fear of the Lord contained in the demand or command to praise God is our thanksgiving to God and redeem for, for the redemption of our soul, spirit, soul, and body. And so thanksgiving or thanking God for the redemption of our spirit, soul, and body. When Jesus will return and rapture his people, then bodies will just be transformed in the blink of an eye. But the true redemption of the sinful body, God needs to do here in the aspect of time. If in the aspect of time, he redeemed your spirit, he redeemed your soul, then he is intending to redeem your body as well, to adopt it. And so praise in our thanksgiving to God is our response to his good work that is contained in the uh, work of redemption that he has done in Christ Jesus before the creation of the world and placed this upon our account in Jesus Christ. And so this place of scripture, Philippians 4, 6 through 7, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, Philippians 4, 6 through 7, to uh, refresh in our mind uh, praise and thanksgiving for something and thanksgiving for those things that are not yet, uh, have not yet happened in our life. We need to uh, keep in mind the reason for this unique nature of thanksgiving when we thank God for something that isn't yet existing. Thanking God, the reason for thanking God for something that has not yet happened in our physical life is that God from his side, when it comes to us, has already done everything and accomplished everything and placed it upon our account in Christ Jesus. And so to take it from our account, any promise where that we have need in and that we are called to be dressed into, we need to fulfill our, our role that is fulfilling specific conditions. And as soon as the condition for that promise will be fulfilled, the heart of our Heavenly Father will be at rest and we will be satisfied with good. And the main condition for fulfilling for, for the redeeming of our bodies is the confession of the faith of our heart in thanksgiving and thank Him for what He has done and placed upon our account in Christ Jesus. We already need to thank God for dressing our body into its new person. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through resurrection of Jesus Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and this, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. Here it's talking about this last revelation, this, uh, this last promise revealed in the last times that many prophets uh, did not n didn't understand. Uh, Daniel didn't understand the things he was seeing, but the Lord said to Daniel, "Go and uh, be at re uh, be at rest. Those in the last times will understand what I am uh, opening up for you today." 
that the new body needs to put on immortality here on earth into its new person, just as we see uh, the pearly gates. This is the new person, but inside of the pearly gate, uh, pearly gates, there is a, a, a an element or the little stone that because a pearl is developed how a mollusk, su- mollusk suffers a little a little tiny stone or something falls into it and because it can't get rid of it it begins to uh, produce this pearl element and coat this uh, stone or whatever falls in and the the more it coats it uh, the the bigger it gets and uh, it's suffering it's it's the results of its suffering produce this pearl and so when people see this pearl they need to understand when we're talking about the 12 pearly gates and every gate is one per, made of one pearl and these gates need to be us through these gates is where the lord will go and he will reign in us we need to have we he will enter and reign that's what it's talking about that the confession of the faith of our heart with thanksgiving for the promises of the imperishable inheritance contained in dressing our body into its new person we will we are doing the work of god that he has committed himself to and gave his son for that he gave us the ability to cast off of ourselves the old man with his deeds he he allowed his son to die so that we may dressed into the death of the lord and by the cross of christ cast off its our old man and then resurrected him from the dead so that he can dress us into the resurrection of his son that is our new person this nature of the, of uh, thanksgiving is the clear demonstration of the faith of god placed in to our spirit and the demonstration of our requests. And so the understanding of such an in, or and receiving of such an inheritance is the collaboration, collaborative work of God and man and as a demonstration of the glory of God and the rule of Christ within our body. Colossians 2, 6 through 7. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Colossians 2, 6 through 7. With thanksgiving. When a person asks for something, he doesn't thank God. A lot of people ask God for healing. Lord, you see, help me, heal me. But here it's talking about the fact that you already have this and thank God that you already have it. Thanksgiving takes it from your from your account. How do you take this promise from your account and use it? It's uh, thanksgiving for the faith you have. You need to believe in it. You need to trust in it. When you truly will trust in God and begin asking and stop asking and thanking God, then fear will, will go away. People come to me saying a doctor has given me this diagnosis and I'm afraid. But I see that they can remove this right now. 70% uh, of of the diagnosis uh, that the doctors will give you are false. And if they give you the incorrect diagnosis, they then treat you uh, in the wrong way because you are not in need of it. And so if you don't have cancer, even even if you don't have cancer and they've determined that you do and you don't, your fear will then produce this cancer. Your fear can do many things. The doctor uh, scares you and I it takes a lot of uh, effort from my side to be able to convince this person that this is not you are not to uh, listen to those things. Faith is information. It's not what you feel. It's what God has said. It's who God is for us and what he has done for us in Jesus Christ. This is what faith is. This is information that comes from God. Many obeyed when I prayed and calmed down. And even if they didn't, I asked for mercy, so God showed them mercy, and they received what they wanted. This was, of course, contrary to what the doctors were saying. There are people that sit here that, contrary to what the doctors said, 
today are healthy and alive. And because they believe the Lord, they will believe further and their bodies will be dressed into their new person. But before God dresses them into their new person, they can already rejoice. If physically, upon your account, someone put $10 million upon your bank account and they tell you, you have this money, but don't take them right now. You will take them at this time. Then you will live already happy because you know it's there. You'll live as one who has the 10 million. That's how you will live. And people ask, what are you doing? Uh, but you say, I have upon my account 10 million and I will take them one day whenever I need to take it. Then I will, if you even borrow, you, you know you can return. Uh, you live as one who has 10 million. But imagine you already have upon your account a new body. You will be delivered from all your illnesses, from uh, aging, from weakness, because the new body, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, dresses the body. It immediately is restored uh, to its uh, primary form. People that are maybe overweight without any diet will become uh, in better form and better appearance because uh, dressing into the new body, you're not going to need to try to do something to make it better. Your skin, if you remember about Naaman, his body became as a little child when he had washed himself in the river. What will happen when a person will be dressed into his new body? His skin will become as one as a little child because the cells will all uh, will immediately be renewed. The life of God will be in every cell of your body. The life of God will be in every cell. What is the body? A body is God's mystery. God created this body for himself. When he created Adam from the earth, he created him for himself so he can live in that body. And so when God showed me, I thought it was a house, but I discovered it's my city. When I was walking in the on the streets of my city in that vision I saw, I saw my cells and I saw six cells. And the most amazing that God showed me my old person and he was in a prison. He was in a cage and he was in a prison. And God showed me the law of sin and death also. This is the holiness of God. It gives power. What is what does the law do? It discovers it it, it uh, discovers it reveals the sin. And this is holiness, and holiness will become your friend when the law of the spirit of life will be in you and ruling in you. Uh, and so there are two trees, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. Eating of the tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil becomes your friend. Afterwards, you have access there. Why? Because you became as God. You legally, lawfully became as God. And as you become, became in God's likeness, the... Holiness of the Lord now belongs to you. He shared his holiness with his priests. And so they first wanted to know the Lord. Adam practically with Eve never ate or tried the tree of life. If they would have done so, God said to him, now you can eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He would have told them that because God made it that people who come to him become or are, are placed before decision, death or life. I offer you death and life. Uh, death is also God. It's also an order. Don't think that in this death there's disorder or chaos. There's no chaos. There's order. And in this order, people will be suffering with, de with the devil forever. And the other order, people will be satisfied forevermore. They will not suffer. They will not think about, there will not be any issues to think about. And so today you have the word of God. You have a great promise upon your account that the Lord has revealed to us in these last times. And as he revealed it, he said through Isaiah, if I have given you the ability to conceive, then can I make it that I will allow you to bear? 
Only a person's unbelief can stand in God's way. Nothing else can stand in God's way. Only a person's unbelief. Uh, opening up your desire with thanksgiving, according to God's will, of course, we trust that upon our account, com a full measure of healing, protection, and providing is on our account. But we need to strive we know we we will know that we'll be united with god and we'll, we'll be an all in all god is that beauty and wealth that we have a lot of people people of the flesh especially hearing these sermons hearing these promises they think about their faces oh when will i finally look younger about their illnesses it's not in our illnesses it's not in our faces or skin it's when when christ is beginning to rule in your body in every cell of your body christ will rule and this will be a demonstration of resurrection in you although this body is still a physical body death will be cast out and that's why the apostle said i will live all forever because this promise is what they believe so let us now bend our knees and pray and thank god for that word that we were able to receive today heavenly father in the name of jesus christ we thank you for your holy self and your name that you revealed to us your inheritance that you have prepared for these last times for the chosen by you people thank you for revealing your truth on any place that you reveal your truth where your holy people seek you get to know you and rejoice in your fear as a person who has received great gain as a great treasure because your godly fear contains your great wisdom and we thank you for your fear within our hearts this is the fruit of the tree of life that you intend to dress us into in the time that you've appointed and the time that is within your power we with joy and patience wait until we're dressed into our new body may the greatness of your word be blessing for us. We thank you that we have these new bodies placed upon our account in Christ Jesus. We thank you that this new body is, or this new person is within our spirit. And we wait with trembling, with reverence. May your mercy be blessed. We worship before you in the beauty of holiness. You are great and mighty in your works, in your works of redemption. You had decided to adopt the body of a holy person in which you want to live. You had decided to make it your house. Before the creation of the universe, you had this body. All of the angels were bowing before this mystery. All were at pause from this surprise thousands of years had passed your house was subject to an unusual attack of evil and sometimes you left it but according to your mercy you returned because you could not change be, you cannot violate your word or break your word the word that you had spoken and placed above all your name you had you worship your word you are dependent upon your word and do not change your words and i thank you that you uh, act in accordance to your word and within the boundaries of it you know my heart and the heart of your people i deeply believe and rejoice in your word and i know that everything you say you will fulfill it everything you've revealed you can do and you can accomplish and grow may your mercy be blessed for your people in dressing our mortal body into its new person amen our father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen I will sing to the Lord 
all my life I will sing to him as I live. And now let us proclaim our unchanging manifestation now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.